Because the Southern nation was so large, many of its leaders believed that the chances of winning the Civil War were two to one in their favor. The Confederacy could win, of course, by defeating Union armies in battle. It could also win by not losing, that is, by holding out defiantly until the Northern people lost the desire to continue the struggle. In either case, the outcome would be decided in Virginia. Uh, Richmond became the center of Upper South manufacturing. Its supplies mostly went to the Army of Northern Virginia. The giant flour mills here produced food for the soldiers and fodder for the horses. Uh, there were seven textile mills here that produced uniforms and tents. And Trudiger Ironworks, where we are now stationed, uh, produced uh, almost 2,000 cannon with the help of Bologna Ironworks across the way. 75 million cartridges were manufactured here. In terms of geology, three different Virginias existed. Near the coast was flat, sandy country known as the Tidewater. To the west were the rolling hills and the clay dirt of the Piedmont. Virginia's western boundary extended to the great Ohio River until the 50 westernmost counties withdrew from the Old Dominion in 1863 and formed the state of West Virginia. Then there was simple geography. Harper's Ferry at the lower end of the Shenandoah Valley jutted into the north. The major rivers of Virginia ran from the west to the Atlantic Ocean. Hence, a Union army advancing south on Richmond had to find a crossing over each river. It usually was going to find Confederates in force waiting at any crossing, and the immense woodlands and plentiful roads of Virginia made the movement of troops much easier. One third of the South's railroads were here in Virginia. The Civil War is the first war in which the railroads play a major part, and they will be a powerful factor. For many reasons, they could move more men and material than could a simple wagon train. They can move it faster, and equally importantly, they could move it in any kind of weather, whereas wagons would become bogged down in the mud from rain and snow. A few days after Virginia's secession, Governor John Letcher named Robert E. Lee to command all of the state's military forces. Lee was a nationally recognized soldier with 30 years Army experience. He had a first-rate mind and a dignified bearing. Lee had become a Confederate because his native country, Virginia, had followed that course. Lee moved at once to prepare the state for almost certain Union invasion. He organized militia units and volunteers into regiments. Orders went out for arms and supplies. The troops arriving from other states were sent to the logical points of attack. Norfolk along the Virginia coast, Northern Virginia close to the enemy capital, and the Harpers Ferry region, the entrance to the agriculturally rich Shenandoah Valley. Across the Potomac River, separating Virginia from the northern states, Union officials were also trying to turn thousands of eager volunteers into an army. By July, both North and South were convinced that one battle would bring victory and end this war. Two armed mobs, not old enough or experienced enough to be called armies, began inching toward one another. At stake was control of the intersection of two railroads at a village called Manassas Junction. It was only 25 miles from Washington. Each side needed the rail lines for communication, supplies, and to protect itself from quick movements by the enemy. On a hot Sunday in July, battle exploded. The Confederates had taken a position along a lazy stream called Bull Run. They were no better prepared for battle than were the Federals, but being on the defensive, they were less likely to make mistakes. For hours, the Federals drove the Confederates back, first across Bull Run, and then halfway up a hill that was the key to the whole field of battle. A Virginia brigade commanded by General Thomas Jackson suddenly appeared on the hilltop. Halfway down the hill, Alabama General Bernard B., seeking to rally his troops and seeing the reinforcements, shouted, Look, men, there's Jackson standing like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. And rally they did, and Jackson attacked, and he helped break the impetus of the Union assault. And by late afternoon, the battle began to die down. But the South had a hero. 
In late afternoon, pieces of the Union Army began drifting to the rear. They collided with hundreds of Washington civilians who had come out with picnic baskets to watch the Civil War begin and end. A massive traffic jam developed on the roads. Then panic and chaos spread over the countryside, created a stampede all the way back to Washington. Southerners sat back to await peace overtures. Yet President Lincoln had no intention of giving up the Union. He named a new general, George B. McClellan, to create a stronger military force, the Army of the Potomac. By springtime, it would number 130,000 men. McClellan was a skilled organizer, but a cautious general. Always afraid of defeat, he had no desire to fight. Before the military operations could resume, Virginia was witness to a big step in naval history. And because the North had a lot more ships than the South had, and the ability to build even more, the Confederate Secretary of the Navy, Stephen Mallory, wanted to build just a few ships that were specially powerful and armed enough that they could take on a whole fleet of Union warships. And what he wanted in particular was an armored warship, an ironclad warship. His hope was to build one from scratch, but that proved to be very difficult. So what they did was take the hull of the USS Merrimack and reconfigure that into an ironclad by cutting away its masts and building a wooden superstructure on top and then iron plating the thing all around with four inches of iron plate on top of two feet of wood. The hope was that no cannonball would penetrate that iron armor. And in March of 1862, Confederate Navy Captain Franklin Buchanan took what had been the USS Merrimack, but was now the CSS Virginia, out into Hampton Roads and attacked and destroyed two Union warships. But the North knew this was happening, and so they were building an ironclad too, and it arrived that same night, the night of the 8th of March, 1862. And the next morning, those two ironclads, the CSS Virginia and the Union's Monitor, which was a flat-decked ship with a turret right in the middle with only two guns, fought each other in the first battle ever between ironclads. They fought all afternoon, and neither one succeeded in doing serious damage to the other, so that it was a tactical draw. But at the end of it, the Union was able to stay in Hampton Roads and continue to maintain its naval superiority. This battle showed that the day of the iron warship was at hand. Every wooden navy in the world was a thing of the past. You have to imagine what it must have been like to be a sailor inside an ironclad warship. You know, these sailors grew up in the age when you stood on the deck of a ship with the, the wind in your hair and you could see the enemy coming at you across the bay. But to be inside that ironclad all shut in with iron walls all around you, it was dark. Only a few lanterns gave gave light to the scene, and they couldn't really tell what was happening on the outside. They weren't sure how far away the enemy was because they couldn't see outside. And then, then the sounds of the guns and shells would be impacting on the armor on the outside. It must have been a very frightening experience. So in a way, the battle in Hampton Roads also showed a different way of fighting at sea, not just between armor clouds, but the way sailors fought their battles as well. That same month, McClellan finally took the offensive because Lincoln ordered him to advance. McClellan's strategy was not to move directly overland toward Richmond. That would involve much fighting. George McClellan, the general of the Union Army, did not want to confront the Confederate Army head to head in Northern Virginia. His plan was to go around it in an amphibious operation, loading his 120,000 men on board Army transports, taking them down the Potomac River, down the Chesapeake Bay, and landing them on the coast of Virginia in that peninsula of land that's formed by the James and the York Rivers, which is why this is called the Peninsular Campaign. Federals would then march up the unguarded peninsula with the rivers protecting their flanks. Richmond would fall with little resistance. The Union offensive was barely underway when word came from west of the Blue Ridge that would force Washington to change his plans and withhold almost a fourth of McClellan's army to protect the capital. Out in the Shenandoah Valley, Stonewall Jackson, with a force barely large enough to be called an army, was wreaking havoc. 
first two Yankee armies were sent against him, one from the north, one from the west. He beat first the one, then the other. In six weeks, Jackson would march his army nearly 600 miles, fight five battles, capture innumerable tons of supplies, and send 60,000 federal soldiers reeling in retreat, and all with his own army of barely 15,000 men. Jackson had turned around the war for Virginians in the spring of 1862, and he'd shown that while he could stand like a stone wall of Manassas, he could move like the wind in the Shenandoah. In the meantime, heavy rains combined with McClellan's natural slowness reduced the Union offensive up the peninsula to a snail's pace. Outnumbered Confederates fell back slowly. Then when a flooded river divided McClellan's army into two wings, Confederate General Joseph Johnston attacked the smaller force at Seven Pines. Much of the two-day battle was in swamps and wet clearings. Johnston fell wounded on the second day. McClellan's advance came to a permanent halt. Richmond lay only nine miles away. On June the 1st, Jefferson Davis named his chief military advisor, Robert E. Lee, to command the South's premier army. Lee was ever aggressive, ever ready to do the unpredictable. He made immediate plans for a counterattack. Before he could launch that assault, however, he had to know where the end of the Union right flank was, and to pinpoint that location, he ordered his cavalry to ride out and reconnoiter the country. The cavalry was under the command of picturesque and dashing Jeff Stewart. Stewart easily found the end of the Union flank, and then Stewart rode completely around the Union army to get back to Richmond. McClellan was humiliated. The Southern people were overjoyed at this uh, feat, and Stewart brought Lee much valuable information. Lee would not strike McClellan head on. Rather, he left 20,000 defenders facing McClellan's 80,000 soldiers and moved most of his forces to strike the northern end of the Federal Army. Stonewall Jackson's men would come from the Shenandoah Valley by road and railroad. They would cooperate with Lee's assault by circling behind the Union position and cutting McClellan's supply line. The vicious battles during the Peninsula Campaign cost 36,000 combined casualties, killed, wounded, and captured. This was more people than lived in Richmond at the beginning of the war. General Lee took great risks in his attacks during the Seven Days Battles. And even though he didn't destroy the Union Army as he hoped to do, he did save the Confederate capital. Now Lee and Jackson turned their thoughts to shifting the war northward to threaten Washington. President Lincoln was disappointed that General McClellan's campaign against Richmond had failed. Now the president combined all the Union armies around Washington under the command of a man named John Pope, who had achieved some success in the war out in Missouri. Pope was not a very likable man, and events would prove that his military skills were not equal to those of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. Early in August, Pope's army started south through the Virginia Piedmont. The Union general's intent was to seize the Central Virginia Rail Junction at Gordonsville and strike toward Richmond from a new direction. Lincoln ordered McClellan to abandon the peninsula and assist in Pope's campaign. Lee beat both Union generals to the punch. Convinced that McClellan no longer posed any threat on Richmond, Lee sent half of his Confederate army under Jackson to Gordonsville to try and stop Pope's advance there. In a sharp fight on August 9th at Cedar Mountain, Jackson did stop Pope. A week later, Lee arrived with the rest of the Confederate army, and the two generals made plans immediately to attack Pope before elements of McClellan's army could reinforce him. General James Longstreet's corps would occupy Pope's attention along the Rappahannock River, while Jackson's half of the army would move north around Pope's forces, turn east through Bull Run Mountains, and strike Pope's supply base at Manassas Junction. Stonewall Jackson's Virginians became known as foot cavalry because they marched so long, so fast. Now, in late August, Jackson took his men on a wide circling march in which they covered 56 miles in two days, then destroyed Pope's supply base far in his rear at Manassas Junction. An angry Pope turned and came after Jackson, 
For two days I was heavy fighting in the woods and open grounds here at Manassas. On August 30th, Pope was in the process of launching a major assault when suddenly James Longstreet and the other half of Lee's army assailed his left flank. The Union army fell back in disorder. Lee had won another victory and for the first time, Virginia was clear of major Union forces. With victory at Second Manassas, Confederate successes came full circle. The war in Virginia had begun 13 months earlier on those same Manassas Hills. Three Union armies had sought to take Richmond. Three other Union military wings had struck the Shenandoah Valley. All had failed. In the 90 days of June, July, and August, Lee had begun fighting at the outskirts of Richmond and soon had shifted the action to the outskirts of Washington itself. It was now time, Lee said, to take the war into the North. 